good afternoon, Saints. Good afternoon. All right, you guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. Give me one second, you're ahead of me. Open your Bibles to Ephesians 5, if you would. What we're going to do this afternoon is look at the role of the Word of God in the believer's life. There are three different points that I want to cover. The first is what the Bible is. Second, what the Bible does. Third, the importance of getting understanding. What the Bible is, what the Bible does, the importance of getting understanding. Let's open it in word prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you you preserved it for us. We thank you it's without error, that it's infallible, that it's sure, it's, yeah. it's accurate, and we can safely trust in everything that it says. Give us insight as we look in it today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So the first subject is what the Bible is. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In Ephesians 5.26, the Bible is likened to water. Get 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So Ephesians likens the word of God to water. First Peter likens it to milk. Get Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. This is one I know you're familiar with. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Get Jeremiah chapter 23. So what we've seen so far is the Bible's likened to water, it's likened to milk, it's likened to bread, it's likened to meat. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 23. 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Yeah, this is sort of a sprint. There's a couple things I want to get through here. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 105. Now, does everyone remember how to find the book of Psalms? <laughs> right? Right. It's right? Yeah, exactly. So, 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, right, we just looked at a whole bunch of verses. They said different things. What was the point of all that? Well, here's, here's the point. If you think about what the Bible is, you can see there's a bunch of different metaphors. One verse says it's water. Another likens it to milk. One likens it to bread. One likens it to meat. One says it's a hammer. 
One says it's a nail. There's, there's all these different metaphors. What, what's the Bible doing? Why doesn't it pick one or two metaphors or symbols and just use those consistently? And what I would suggest to you what the Bible is doing is it's showing you that the Word of God is the Swiss Army knife of your life. Right? You know what a Swiss Army knife is, right? So it's got the saw and the scissors and the corkscrew and the toothpick and the nail, and, you know, it's got all these things, right? The bottle opener. And what happens is if you have that one tool, you can address almost any problem. And what I would tell you is that that's the function of the Word of God in your life. It's there to meet whatever needs that you have. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Rick was in, so, in this very passage just a little bit ago. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice what it says here. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Word of God is sufficient to equip you for everything that God would have you to do. Amen. Amen. Right. It's good. Well, no, what you have to do first is you have to go to cemetery. Right? <laughs> because if you don't spend enough years there, then you won't know what you're doing. Cemetery. Not really. Right? The Word of God is sufficient to truly furnish you yes, sir. Amen. unto all good works. I think that's why it uses all those different metaphors. Get with me James chapter 1. So you've seen some, some symbols there of what the, the Bible is. I'm going to show you a couple things that the Bible does. James chapter 1 verse 21. James 1 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, notice, which is able to save your souls. According to get Acts 20. So according to James, the word is able to save your soul. Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. <coughs> Acts chapter 20, verse 32. In Acts 20, Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders. He knows it's the last time he's going to speak with them. And so he's giving them some parting advice as to how he thinks, uh, what, what they need to do for their lives to function properly. Notice verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. So he's entrusting them to God's word, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So not only can the Word save you, it can also build you up and give you an inheritance. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. The Word of God nourishes the believer. Amen. Yes. One thing I'll just say about that before we move on. The vast majority of churchianity is malnourished. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes, sir. Because if the Word of God is what, is what nourishes you, then... You can be saved, but if you're not built up, if you're not instructed by the Word of God, you won't have the nourishment, you won't have the, the, the equipping that you need to function properly in this life. And that's where much of churchianity is. Give me Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, look at verse 28. My soul melted for heaviness, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. So the word can strengthen you. Get Luke 24. Luke 
Luke 24 is, is one of my personal favorites. But what's happening in this passage is two of the disciples are on the road to Emmaus and the Lord speaks with them and they don't, they don't perceive who he is at the first. Notice what they say in verse 32. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And what they're saying there is they got heartburn in a good way when the Lord opened to them the scriptures. Now I'm sure you've all felt this. When you got saved, if you think of the moment or the time when you came to see a right decision, we've all had experiences where you're in fog and darkness and you come to understand something and there's a peace and a joy and an assurance that comes from that, right? Amen. That comes from the Scriptures being opened, right? Yes, sir. If, if that doesn't happen, if you're not investing the time to make that happen, that, that won't occur in your life. It doesn't happen by chance, right? It happens as a result of being involved in God's Word. So we've seen what the Bible is, we've seen what the Bible does, and I'll just suggest this to you. The, the Bible is the answer to the problems of your life. Amen. It, it, it's not emotion, it, it, it's not experience, it's not tradition, it's, it's nothing other than the Word solving your problems by you getting into it, by, by right. exposing your, your soul to it. Amen. Yes, sir. So get Colossians 2. Now I covered the first two points really quickly, which means I get to spend a lot of time on this last point. So Colossians chapter 2, this last point is about the importance of getting understanding. So look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. And then notice this part. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And I want to take that particular phrase, the full assurance of understanding. If you're saved, you're 100% saved, right? Amen. You can't lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved, it's done. That's true even if you go into heresy, right? That's true even if you stop believing. Because you're not saved by your works, you're not saved by your continued faithfulness. The moment you're saved, you are eternally saved. Amen. Right? Amen. But, understand this. You can be saved and still be full of confusion. You can be saved and full of uncertainty. You can be saved and always in doubt. What I personally think happens, you decide for yourself, I think what happens is there are saved people that are completely confused about how their life works. There are saved people that the verses in Hebrews unsettle their entire life. Yes, sir. Right? That's exactly right. So when you get saved, you think, I should start reading the Bible. Right? And you pick it up and you start somewhere. And that's what you should do, isn't it? I picked it up and started reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I, you know, I didn't know any better. And I noticed, gee, some of these things don't feel quite right. But they have to be right because they're in the Bible. So what's going on? And Paul seems to just resonate more with what I understand. But, wow, this stuff after Paul is sort of terrifying. Right? There's people that can draw back unto perdition. There's a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. And so what happens, you, you decide for yourself, I think what happens is this. Well, there are these verses that teach eternal security. But these other ones don't. And just to be safe, touch all my bases, check off in the entire list, I better worry about those. And I think for many people, those verses come to dominate their life. Right? Because look, if, if eternal security is true, and you're worried about it, then you're still saved. But what if eternal security is false? 
Well, then you better make sure you endure unto the end. Uh, yeah. So, so what I find to be the case is the vast majority of churchianity, and let's just talk about those that are saved, are saved, but totally lacking in the full assurance of understanding. Amen. That's right. Right? Because they can point to verses in the Bible that unsettle them, that confuse them about their relationship with God, that confuse them about what they should be doing. I think it works like this. Once you get saved, and you understand that, you then ask the next question, which is, okay, what do I do with the rest of my life? I'm saved, but now what? What's next? And that's the question I sort of want to look at with you during the rest of the time we have. Everyone wants to get to the next life and hear the equivalent of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen. But that's not going to happen for many. I mean, just to be honest with you. What the Word can do, get 1 Corinthians 3. What the Word can do is it can give you the full assurance as to what you should be doing. Now, as you're turning there, let me just call something out for you. So as you think about the dispensation of grace in which we live, it's going to end with the rapture, the catching up, the adoption, the redemption of the body. And then immediately after that, the body of Christ, each member of the body of Christ, goes through the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to look at this in 1 Corinthians 3. And you just need to understand that this is, if you will, the report card that you're going to get. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So the judgment seat of Christ specifically is an evaluation of workmanship. It said it right there, right? The fire shall try every man's work. It's going to be tested by fire. People can choose to build with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. So obviously it makes a tremendous difference what you build with. So one of the questions we need to know the answer to is, what is gold, silver, precious stones? I mean, don't you want to, at the judgment seat of Christ, have your work approved? Yes. Well, and if so, then we need to understand what that is. Now, let me just make this point. God's holiness, God's righteousness, cannot reward bad workmanship. Right? Right. If He's laid out the standard and told us what to do, He's not going to ignore it. Right? Amen. So, so he, His justice requires proper <laughs> workmanship, so we need to know how to do that. You've probably heard the phrase, measure once, cut twice, measure twice, cut once. Has everyone heard that? Well, here's the way that, that works in my life. My saying for that is, no job is complete until you go to Home Depot the second time. <laughs> right? Because what happens is, you start on the project, you get part way through the project, and you realize, oh, I need X. Right? They haven't done this yet, but I'm expecting, oh, Mr. Reed, so good to see you again. You're back soon. Right? And that's the way it works. And the point is, Measure twice, cut once is, if you spend the time to make sure you know what you're doing in advance, the job goes better. And if you're hasty, you cut twice. You have to go get a new board, right? See the point? Give me Proverbs 16 and Proverbs 20. Look, if you're going to do a building project, you need to make doubly sure you know what you're doing before you start using power tools. Right? Yeah. Look at Proverbs 16, 16. I'm going to show you what I think the gold, silver, precious stones is. You should, you should search this out for yourself and satisfy yourself this is true. You certainly shouldn't rely upon me. Proverbs 16, 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. So which is better, riches in this life or 
wisdom. Amen. Obviously, wisdom. Amen. Wisdom is better than gold. Understanding is better than silver. Get Proverbs 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Get Job 28. Job chapter 28, verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, but it is wisdom and understanding. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. So based upon those two passages, Proverbs 16, uh, Proverbs 20, and then Job uh, 28, I believe it's the case that the Bible is using gold, silver, precious stones to represent wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Okay, I think that's the case. You should definitely double check that and not rely upon me. Now get with me Colossians 1. The reason I tell you that is I think what's going on, I think what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 3 about the judgment seat of Christ is that as you build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, you have to do that with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Amen. Look with me at Colossians 1, verse 9. What further leads me to that conclusion is we're going to look at some of the things that Paul prayed and see if you notice a theme here. Colossians 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, now notice this, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Get up to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Get 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be ye men. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you about something. Normally when we think about praying for one another, often our prayer requests center on earthly conditions. Right? Yeah. Health, finances, things like that. That's okay. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is curious that when Paul prays for people, you know what he prays for them to have? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He wants them to have an understanding of what God's will is. He, we saw that in Colossians. He says that in other places. So what I would suggest to you is sort of the highest priority of our prayers for one another. One of the fundamental objectives we need to have is to grow in understanding. That we would know what God wants us to do so we can then do that. Now think with me about 1 Corinthians 3 just for a moment. Paul describes the judgment seat of Christ as he laid this foundation. He says, take heed how you build upon, build thereupon, because other foundations can no man lay than that is laid which is Christ Jesus. He, he's specific about the foundation, and he's very specific about the building material. And I don't know if you've ever encountered this or not, but sometimes on building projects, people like build things in the wrong place. I mean, I've actually been on job sites where that happened. It was supposed to be here, and it's here. And what do you do when it's here and it's supposed to be here? So if either the thing always looks wrong, and 20 years later they're like, yeah, Bob put it there. He wasn't supposed to, but he did. So either you leave it there and it always looks bad, or what do you do? It's just waste, right? Which is why, think about your life that way. But you can't redo this life. Once you're saved, you're not going to lose your salvation. But imagine the... The disappointment 
if you get to the end of this life and you did all these things with zeal that God's not doing, yes. that would be bad. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 15. 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 15. Now as we look at these two passages, tell me if these are good cross-references. No, notice something here. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Paul's saying there, he laid the foundation. He's very specific about that. Now notice Romans 15, verse 20. Yeah. Romans 15, and verse 20. <coughs> Romans 15, 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Yes. Who's the another man in Romans 15, 20? <coughs> Peter, right? Yeah. Paul's very specific in Romans 15 about not building upon Peter's foundation. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 3, he's very specific in saying that he as a wise master builder has laid the foundation. I'll say this, you can decide for yourself. It is improper today to build on Peter's foundation. Yes, sir. Right? Amen. Paul is the wise master builder. He laid the foundation in Romans 15. He specifically good. says, I am careful not to build upon another man's foundation. So if that's the case, if it's wrong to build upon Peter's foundation today, then consider this. I'll make an assertion. I'll try to prove it. The vast majority of churchianity's <coughs> labors today yeah. are built upon Peter's foundation yeah. and hence wrong. Yes, sir. Amen. That's Amen. Right. That's good. Sincere? Perhaps. Approved? No. That's right. Right? Wow. So let's see if I can prove that. <coughs> And I'm going to give you some examples. So I want to give you some examples where I would suggest the vast majority of what churchianity is doing today is they are building upon Peter's foundation and especially they're building upon the foundation of the Lord's earthly ministry. That's right. That's it. Yes, That's right. So here's the first example. You ready? Red Letter Bibles. <laughs> yeah. Now this is a red letter Bible right here, so it's okay to, to own them. But what does a red letter Bible say? We're going to put the words of Christ in red because they're the most important. First of all, that is an attack on the authority of God's word, right? Yeah. Because it's suggesting the rest of it is somehow lesser. So that's just ridiculous. That's right. Amen. Good preaching. But the thing that it is also doing, what is it implicitly telling people? Let's assume you're me and you're newly saved. And someone hands you a red letter Bible. Okay, I get it. I'm not dumb. Those are the most important things. Right? I mean, that's the message it sends, right? So, churchianity starts here and for the most part ends there. That's right. Right? Because the red letters are most important. And that's what they do. That's where they focus their time. And it's utterly backwards, isn't it? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Jesus Christ resurrected, and he didn't quit. Right. After that, he gave some new information yeah. to someone, yeah, didn't right. he? Amen. That leads me to point two. What would Jesus do? <laughs> right? <laughs> what would Jesus do is about, let me get this bracelet... And as I'm thinking through the struggles or the, the trials of life, I should do what Jesus would do. But what they're really saying is, 
I should look for an example in his earthly life, is what they're really saying, right? Yeah. Because the true answer of what would Jesus do is, he'd appear to a murderer on the road to Damascus and give him the dispensation of grace. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you really wanted to do what Jesus would do, you would listen to who he chose. Amen. Right? That's right. Yeah. But yeah. what would Jesus do is just a very simplistic, confused idea that focuses on the Lord's ministry before the cross. Look at me at Acts 26. Acts 26 and 1 Corinthians 14. Amen. Acts 26 and 1 Corinthians 14. Acts 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee. By the way, that's in red letters. For this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. So the Lord appeared to Paul not only in Acts 9, but he appeared to him later than that, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And so if we want to do what the Lord would have us to do, we better understand who he appeared to when and what he told him. Amen. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Yes, amen. Yes, sir. One of the things that happens within churchianity today is Paul is slandered. Right? right. Yeah. yeah. So some people will say that Paul is a woman hater. You, you know, you know that's what they say, right? And if, if you follow the words of Paul, people will say you make too much of Paul. You worship Paul. We don't follow Paul. We follow Jesus. All that silly, silly stuff. That's right. What Scripture right. says is, if you're actually spiritual, what do you need to do? The things that are given to Paul are the Lord's commandments. Yes, that's right. When you are not Pauline, you are disobedient to Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? Amen. I like it. Amen. Good. That's true. Get with me Matthew 6. So you know how popular red letter Bibles are. <laughs> and you know how popular what would Jesus do bracelets are. What's the most Prayed prayer on the earth today. Oh my God. You know it. All right, Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then notice verse 10. What's it say? Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. When the Lord taught His disciples to pray that prayer, the dispensation of grace was a secret. I try. It was hidden. So, what they expected to happen at that point in time, and by the way, this whole place on the chart right here is four years. I know it's like a foot and a half, but it's only four years. <laughs> right? They're talking about the kingdom because after the cross... There's going to be a one-year period of time right in here. The dispensation of grace was unknown. So what do they expect to happen next? Right there. Yeah. Daniel's 70th week, right? Yeah. So when the Lord tells them to pray, Thy kingdom come, He's not saying it's 2,000 years away. In Acts 2, when Peter stands up, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 70th week. So the second coming is right around the corner. It's not far away. Amen. Right. That's what they prayed at that time. What the Lord's Prayer does, if you are praying the Lord's Prayer, you are looking for the second coming. Right? What indeed should you be looking for today? The rapture. The rapture. You should be looking at leaving. Now think about this with me. So if you pray the Lord's Prayer... You know what else you should be looking for? <laughs> yeah. The tribulation. Right? And a whole bunch of churchianity thinks they're going through it. Right? And if you pray the Lord's Prayer, you naturally would think that. 
Yeah. Right. Because that's what was going to happen to them. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, that's what we're doing. That's right. We're Amen. waiting for him to take us home. We're not waiting for him to establish a kingdom on this earth. Amen. That's right. Now think about this with me if you would. I mentioned earlier that you can be saved and unsettled. If you thought you should pray the Lord's Prayer. If you think then that your spiritual Israel, as much of churchianity does, then tell me why you wouldn't expect to go right into the tribulation. Shouldn't you think that? Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, when Peter stands up in Acts 2, doesn't he tell them, guys, we're going into the 70th week. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great coming of the great noble day of the Lord. He's talking to them about the 70th week. It will have an unsettling effect on your life. Yes, sir. If you think you're going through that. Yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. right? Amen. That's why people panic all the time about. Have you noticed that whenever there is any sort of natural disaster or political event, everyone goes and buys all the bread? <laughs> right? Yeah. I better go fill up the car with gas. Why? Where are you going? <laughs> Why? Well, I just need to. I got to go buy all the bread. I got to go buy the water. What you're seeing there is emotional panic of an unsettled mind. That's right. Yes, sir. Right? Amen. Yes, sir. That's what people are operating under. Now, think about this with me then. Thy kingdom come. So if you're praying the Lord's Prayer and you're thinking about His kingdom coming, what much of churchianity then does is they conclude that it is their responsibility to help the Lord out by bringing in His kingdom. That's right. Isn't, isn't that what they do? That's right. And so what happens is we just need to elect more of our people to office. <laughs> right? And their churchianity metastasizes into simply political activism. Amen. Mm, amen. That's what happened. That is a very that's not what the Lord called you to do. That's right. That's right. right? That's right. Amen. amen. Listen, you can has not life experience told you that even when you put the candidates you want into office, they still don't do what they should? <laughs> when, when will we learn this? Right? Instead, we need to get some people saved. Amen. Right? Amen. They will dedicate. Then let the Holy Spirit work on their politics. Amen. Oh, by the way, let me ask you this. When the second coming happens... Does the Lord establish His kingdom by popular vote? No, 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 no. What does He do? Respire. Blood flows for 200 miles at the, at the level of a horse's bridle. Right? Right. What happens is He returns and He kills everyone that thinks He shouldn't be king. Right? Yes, sir. So you get a chance to vote. <laughs> but my point is God didn't call us to fix the, the, the earth system Amen. 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 They're, they're, they're populated with sinful men they're never going to be any good until the Lord returns then he's going to establish a perfect one and people will hate that that's it, that's it. Right? <laughs> Look, so you're in Matthew let's read more of the Lord's Prayer get Matthew 6 Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now you know that's contrary to 2 Thessalonians where Paul says, if any man shall not work, let him not eat. Now look at verse 12. This one's, I think, problematic. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Now, if you read verse 12, as it is written, what it really says is this. God, grant us forgiveness on the basis of our forgiving of other people. Right? And if you have doubt about that, look at verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The Lord's Prayer teaches conditional forgiveness. Right. Yep. Sure you don't get forgiveness until you forgive others first. That's right. Right. Look with me at Ephesians 4, Colossians 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind, and, and I'm sorry, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. That's it. Amen. So Ephesians 4 says God has already forgiven you. Amen. Now you can forgive others. It's not conditional. Grace is front loaded. Yes. God gives you the blessing first, right. and then you should live out of gratitude, but He gives you the blessing even if you're an idiot. <coughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, praise right. God. Yeah. Matthew 6 is the opposite. If you forgive others first, then you get forgiveness, but if you don't, then you don't. Amen. Right. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for the power of you. Now, here's the thing. I, I, so I, I say this. When you operate according to the wrong dispensational doctrine, it will unsettle your life yes. because it will place obligations on you the Lord doesn't intend to place on you. That's right. Amen. Amen. Right. And you'll have guilt for not performing those things that you're not performing. Amen. Okay, so we looked at the most popular prayer in Christianity. We looked at red letter Bibles. So the next question would be, what's the fastest growing segment of churchianity? Charismaticism, right? Yeah, that's right. Pentecostalism. Give with me Mark 16. Look at Mark 16. Mark chapter 16. And what I'll suggest to you is simply this. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel preached by John the Baptist and Peter and the Lord and the Twelve, the gospel of the kingdom is connected with water baptism, healing, signs and wonders, and speaking in tongues. It's connected with all those things. So look at me at Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. I don't know if you've noticed this recently, but there's been a lot of stories about exorcisms, you know, where people are actively trying to cast out devils. It's become something of a fad. I don't know if you pay much attention to this or not. Have you ever noticed in the Christian bookstore there are all these books on spiritual warfare? Yeah. Yes. And when you read these, they're fiction books about here's the hero of the story and there's an angel behind the scenes watching over him and here's the bad guy and there's a devil here and they fight and they have like mystical swords. And it's like all this... Star Wars adventure. I don't know what it is. Like it's, not, it's not real. It's not it, it, fantasy. Yeah, it's fantasy. It, 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 it's just not real at all. Look with me. Um, so, you, you know, I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but tongues are a sign for unbelieving Jews. 1 Corinthians 1.22, 1 Corinthians 14.22. Look at, look at Mark 16, verse 18. They shall take up serpents... And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Then notice this. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now you've probably heard this, but one of the things that happens is you hear all the stories of what is going on overseas. Right? Yeah. And so what happens overseas is there's massive healing programs going on, and they're raising the dead. Yeah, right? right? 
And what happens is all of these things happen in places where it can't be verified, right? You just have to take their word for it. Get with me Matthew 4, verse 23. So when you look at the commission that the Lord gave in, in Mark 16, you can see it's a commission related to the gospel of the kingdom. It's connected with water baptism, healing, signs and wonders, speaking in tongues, and so on. Look at Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now notice what it's connected to. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now if you're going to be honest with the scriptures, the gospel of the kingdom should be connected with healing. Right? right? It is in Matthew 4.23. It is in Matthew 9.35. It is in Mark 16. Yes. Get Exodus 19 if you would. Now what I want to do next is I want to show you something. I want to show you there is a very specific doctrinal reason that the gospel of the kingdom is connected with the things that it is. Specifically with healing, with water baptism and so on. So get Exodus chapter 19 verse 5. Exodus 19 in verse 5. Exodus 19.5 Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now notice verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. I'm going to suggest this to you. The gospel of the kingdom is related to Israel being a kingdom of priests. Yeah. Yeah, so in Exodus 19, when the Lord tells Moses, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests, the gospel of the kingdom is about that. Now let me show you some connections. Look with me, if you would, at Leviticus 21. Leviticus chapter 21. Leviticus 21, verse 17. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 18, For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crookbacked, <coughs> or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. So just to be clear on what Leviticus 21 is saying, when there was a, a member of the seed of Aaron, but he had some sort of physical deformity, whatever it was, you saw the list there, he was disqualified from the priesthood. Amen. Because the priesthood was holy. Years ago... Uh, Mom was going to get us a new dog. And she went to a breeder and she found this perfect dog. And the dog was one that the breeder would have showed, a little like using competition, it was just an amazing dog, but it had this one technical defect. And that technical defect made the dog useless for competition. But for a dog owner like us, who cares? Didn't make any difference to us. Well, it's the same thing here. God is a holy God. Amen. Yeah. The folks of the seed of Aaron that were going to be placed in the priesthood had to meet that exact standard of physical perfection. Now the reason I tell you that is this. Think about this with me if you want. There is a very clear healing program right there during the Lord's earthly ministry. Amen. Does that go on the entire time of the Old Testament? <coughs> it doesn't. 
I mean, there's people throughout the Old Testament with leprosy and all kinds of other problems. Why does it happen there? It happens there because John the Baptist shows up preaching the gospel of the kingdom because they're going to form a kingdom of priests and if you're going to put the nation of Israel, believing Israel, into that kingdom of priests, then they have to be perfect physical specimens and hence there must be a program of healing. Amen. In other words, the healing program was specifically for the purpose of establishing that kingdom of priests. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's why it was done. It wasn't just done for kicks. It wasn't just done to perform a spectacle so someone could look at it. It had a doctrinal purpose. Amen. Get Exodus 29. So the first requirement of being put into the priesthood is you have to be a perfect physical specimen. But that's not all. Look at Exodus 29. Exodus 29 verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. There's a, there's a ceremony that you have to put people through to put them into the priest's office. Look at verse 4. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. Who wants to guess what that is? <laughs> right? John the what? Why is he doing that? He's forming a kingdom of priests. Priests. Isn't it obvious? It's obvious. Well, people say, I think you should be baptized today to follow the Lord in baptism. <laughs> that, has, that shows a complete lack of understanding of what God was doing. Amen. Yes. Look at verse 7. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. After folks were water baptized, did someone show up in Acts 2? The Comforter to anoint people? Yeah. Here's what's going on. <clears throat> to be placed in the priesthood, you have to be a perfect physical specimen. You have to be washed with water. You have to be anointed with oil. When you look at what happens during the Lord's earthly ministry and immediately following, it is exactly that. Yes. That's why there was a healing program. That's why there was a water baptism. That's why the Lord promised to send the Comforter. So what that means is this. When you think about the charismatic movement today, when you think about Pentecostalism, what it is, is hundreds of millions of Gentiles following God's plan to make Israel into a kingdom of priests. Right. right. It is a complete and utter waste of time. Amen. Yeah. Number one, God's not doing it today. And number two, if He was, He wouldn't be doing it with Gentiles. Amen. 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 It's just mindless. And then what happens, of course, as a dispensationalist, everyone wants to fight with us over the subject of water baptism. Yeah. Right? Yeah, all the time. It drives them crazy. <laughs> when you study water baptism, the purpose of it is to put someone into the Levitical priesthood. Amen. Why would you possibly do that today? That's right. Good priest. I, I, I mean, Amen. why would you do that? I'll wrap this up by saying this. The Word of God can give you the full assurance of understanding. Amen. What it can do is it can give you clarity as to what you should be doing so that you don't waste your time. Yes, sir. Amen. If you spend your time living according to the red letters, I'm sorry, that's not what you should be doing. Amen. That's right. If you live Amen. your life on the basis of conditional forgiveness, that's wrong. If you lead your life on the basis of what the Lord did during His earthly ministry, that's wrong because He's given further revelation that He told us to follow. That's right. And if you live your life as the vast majority of churchianity is, trying to 
basically bring in the Levitical holy nation kingdom of priests, it, it's just absolutely not what God is doing today. It's not what he, Let me put it this way. What if you're hired for one job at your company, and you decide, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to do a totally different job, totally unrelated to what you hired me to do. Would anyone appreciate that? No. I mean, would your boss say that's okay? What you would do is you would just be running around getting in people's way, accomplishing very little. Right? Right. That's what's happening. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so I'll say this and I'll close. Oh, wait a minute. I have another page. So the, 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 right? Go ahead. I have to I'm sorry about that. I, I could feel like something's wrong. It's like, that's not a conclusion. Forgive me. All right, you ready? So much of churchianity is building upon the wrong foundation because they're building right there in the kingdom program. Yeah. I want to show you one other thing that's a problem. There is a problem today that is rampant, which is mixing prophecy and mystery. So let me give you an example of that. The setting of the date of the rapture. Yeah. Now, I don't know if, hopefully you guys haven't had to deal with this. In the last three years, I've had three different months where a bunch of people are all excited about the raptures happening then, right? So one was in 2015, there was one in 20, uh, 2017, and that didn't happen, and then they sort of amended it, and it's happening in October, but then it didn't happen then, so it's just like, you know, they just yeah. keep amending it. There's actually an entire Wikipedia page just devoted to common predicted dates for the rapture that haven't happened. Now, let me just make the point here. I, I once had a very lengthy, um, I read a very lengthy treatise on why the guy concluded that the rapture was going to happen on such and such date. And when you read what he did, and you know this, is there anything in Paul that would give you a specific year or a specific date? No. no. There's, there's nothing even close. So what happens as you read these materials, you quickly see they take some rapture verses in Paul, but then they date it based upon different prophetic scriptures. Right. And so it's one of those things, even if you're reading a 200-page document, you can immediately tell this isn't going to make any sense because you started out by mixing things that God told you not to mix. Amen. Right? That's good. Amen. So they, they combined two things that they weren't supposed to. Confusion. A similar thing to that, a bunch of the body of Christ today thinks they're going into the tribulation. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So they then end up with a mid-trib rapture or a post trib rapture or whatever because they're mixing two things. Get with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The third thing that people love to do, there's obviously a great obsession with prophecy in our day. One of the things that's common is people identifying who the Antichrist is. Yeah. You guys want to into this? Yeah. Here's my rule on that. Here's, the, here's what that simply is. The Antichrist is whatever Middle East political figure you don't happen to like at that time. <laughs> right? So when Saddam's in power and doing all sorts of bad things, which he was, then he's the Antichrist. But then he dies, so you have to pick a new one. Right? And so this is sort of the way the game is played. But look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now notice this. The he who letteth will let, I personally believe, is the body of Christ the dispensation of grace. You can do it for yourself. <laughs> Verse 8. Notice what it says here. And then shall that wicked be revealed. So verse 7, the body of Christ has to be taken out of the way at the catching, and then after that shall the wicked be revealed. Amen. Amen. So what does that tell you about whether you can predict who the Antichrist is before that happens? Okay. It hasn't even been revealed. Amen. You see the point? Yes. The wicked is, is, isn't even revealed until we're gone. 
Much of Christianity today is busyness without wisdom. It is activity without understanding. It is measure once, cut twice. Right? It is poor workmanship that very likely will not be approved at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. Right. Many of you know that Billy Graham recently died. I want to read to you a couple quotes from him real quick. We're almost done. This was some quotes he had about whether he had any regrets in his life. I'm not going to read all of it to you. I'm just going to pick things. I would do many things differently. For one thing, I would speak less and study more. When I look back over the schedule I kept 30 or 40 years ago, I am staggered by all the things we did and the engagements we kept. Skipping ahead. I would spend more time studying the Bible and meditating on its truth. So Billy Graham obviously had a very packed schedule preaching the gospel. I believe this is the case. I think it is the case that he preached the gospel to more people than anyone in history just because of technology. I, I, don't, I think that's the case. You can disagree with that. But I want, what I want you to notice is this. He gets to the end of his life, all that activity, all that business, and what he says is, I would study more. I would do less, and I would study more. Because part of being a workman is, if you just sleep in and start the doing before you're clear on what you're doing, it's not good. That's right. You're, you're likely to mess things up. Yes, sir. Right. Get with me, Luke 4. Luke 10, I'm sorry. Luke 10. Three more passages and we're done. Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. So Martha's busy, 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 waiting on the Lord. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. It's more important to get instructed by the Lord in His Word so we can then serve Him effectively than just be busy. Amen. Yes. Proverbs 4 and then Philippians 1 and we're done. Proverbs 4. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 has a passage where many of our dispensational brethren will revise the passage to suit their own agenda. But it's better off not to do that sort of thing. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Notice what Paul prays here. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment. He wants the saints to grow in understanding that they might know what God would have them to do. Amen. Notice what he then says in verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent. I know people want to change that to things that differ, but when you do that, you're just you're suggesting the word of God is inaccurate. And so it's not a sensible thing to do. The reason why it says you may approve things that are excellent, I believe, is the following. As a saved person, the issue in your life is how do you spend the rest of your time? Yes. Right? Amen. Yes. And so you have limited moments, and what you need to do is you have to pick the very best things. There's a lot of things that involve activity and busyness, but are not spiritually profitable. The moral of the story about Pentecostalism, about all of the investment of time that church humanity has in the Lord's earthly ministry, I fear that what happens to that is people show up at the judgment seat of Christ, 
Lord, look at all we did. Yeah. None of that is what I asked you to do. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that the, yeah. isn't that the fearful reality of that? Mm -hmm. Well, what that means for us is we need to be in the book. Yeah. We need to get the wisdom and knowledge and understanding so that we can choose to invest the scarce moments of our lives for the most valuable thing for the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what we need to be about. Getting wisdom from God's Word can save you from a busy but poorly invested Christian life. Amen. Father, thank you for your time. We thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to meet Amen. together. May your word impact our hearts. May we yield our lives to you in a way that would please you and that we would spend our time in a way that would be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name.